All right, good evening and welcome. My name is Miyoko Chu. I'm the Senior Director of Communications at the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. And with me tonight are Charles Eldermeyer, our BirdCams project leader, and Ben Walters on his way here. He's our BirdCams communications specialist. And we also have Victoria Campbell here who worked with us on the BirdCams in the past and is still with us at the lab in a different role. So we're really happy to have Victoria too. So thank you so much for joining us, whether you're here with us on campus tonight or whether you're tuning in on the live stream. You are a community and a family to us and we really cannot thank you enough for the engagement and the support that you've given us. What we see happening on the bird cams is really extraordinary. It's extraordinary not only because we can see into the lives of birds in ways that are so often beautiful and revelatory, but also because the emergent discoveries, conservation impacts and um, community interactions are really something larger than any of ourselves. In the next hour, we'd like to share with you our appreciation for that phenomenon and take a look ahead to the future. So after the talk, we'll invite your questions uh, and your comments, and we'll probably alternate between the audience here in the auditorium and our live streaming audience. So with that, Charles. Great. As usual, those of you who have ever watched the cam, the live chat, know that often you're trying to watch the cam and do something else in live chat all at the same time. So um, welcome tonight. And just to echo really what um, Miyoko said, uh, it's really fun. The times that we've had the opportunity of, to, to get together in real life, IRL, as the, the young kids say these days. Um, and really tonight we thought uh, we would capitalize on the fact migration celebration was here, was here in town today. How many of you actually went to migration celebration as well? So for those of you online, nearly every hand in this room went up. And that migration celebration is a day long event that happens over at the Lab of Ornithology. Um, to just try and let you guys know how much we do appreciate you and appreciate what we've done, where we've been and, and together and, and talk about hopefully ways we're gonna continue to, go, to move together in the future. So um, as you're all obviously aware, but I can't make my screen, uh, there we go. Um, as I just was posting in the chat, technical glitches are the things that make life interesting. If everything always worked, it wouldn't be that much fun. So the cams take us into the lives of birds across the hemisphere. And you know, for the first time in history, we've been able to see what happens 24 seven, as you all know, thanks to the live streaming technology that we use and the fact that viewers are always watching. Some of you, I know, I've, I've, you watch, we have some of our like 100, you know, percenters in the room today that, that have watched probably everything that's ever happened on a cam. And, uh, you know, one viewer tuned in and told us that watching the cams is a little bit like uh, doing field biology in their own living room. And we all really liked that idea about how watching a cam is a little bit like doing field biology. And a lot of us have been field biologists in the past. Um, but the crazy thing is the cams take it one step further. Field biology, you almost never get a pretty view, a nice tight view like you get on a camera. Um, you also, though, on a camera, don't get to see everything that's happening around it. So that, that tension between those two things often drives a lot of what we talk about on the cams and, and what we learn from each other sort of thinking about and questioning. So the images up on screen here are from cameras that we've streamed either by ourselves or with collaborators over the last 12 months. You probably recognize a lot of these species, and if you don't, you're gonna see probably some highlight clips throughout this talk and we'll, we'll, we'll give you a little bit of an example. Um, so more than a million people tune into the cams each year and over the, over the last six years, that means millions of people have watched. Um, collectively, we've been watching these cameras for about 4,000 years worth of time. Okay, we're talking Egypt, right? We're talking pyramids, we're talking um, that just in these six years, just on our cams. We're not talking the cameras, all the other cameras that are out there. So imagine that impact, people learning about the natural world. And we're not just watching. Uh, as we found out very early, people like to communicate about what they're seeing. And we get emails, tweets, Facebook posts, live chats, people talking to each other, people talking to us, us all talking together. Um, and it's a crazy uh, new medium for understanding the world. And then some people even decided they wanted to spend more time 
volunteering. And um, we really wanted to thank all the volunteers who have helped make this CAM experience what it has been over the years, whether that's leading chats, tweeting out your observations, operating the cameras, uh, as well as our, the birders on the ground that have spent so much of their time following around the birds and finding out what happens to them off camera. So if you'd like, uh, if you're here in the room and you've ever volunteered, you're a birder on the ground, if you'd like to stand up and just let everybody know, I'm not gonna make anybody stand up. And if you're out there in the chat, um, please feel free to give a shout out um, so we know you're out there too. Volunteers, birders on the ground, we'd love to, love to stand up and wave, yeah. You know, and some of these people have, have traveled hundreds or even thousands of miles to be here. And to those of you online, uh, we had a nice group of people standing up in here and, and some of them had to be dragged up. Um, uh, so, you know, and really what's brought us, one way that we kind of thought about this talk is just science, discovery, conservation, community, these themes that keep on bubbling up every time we have a camera or a com conversation. But it all kind of starts with that magic moment of being able to see birds up close without disturbing them. You know, we're drawn in by the surprising, delightful, and unexpected scenes that just unfurl in front of us. And what I loved about this clip of um, the great horned owl in Savannah, Georgia, is some of you might know that great horned owls make a threat display. She's basically right now posturing to a bald eagle that flew by. You could, if you heard earlier in the clip, you could hear one call and then she popped up. But if you've ever been on the receiving end of one of these threat displays, you always see it from the other side because they're pointing at you and they have these bright yellow eyes and everything is super camouflaged, you know, tiger of the skies. Yet in this video, which seems to have just stalled, um, let's see, should get to the point where you can see her eyes when she comes around, but um, you'll have to trust me on this. Uh, <laughs> she turns around and you can see these bright yellow eyes. It worked great in the warmups. Um, so, so that unknown, just even like now, um, you know, without disturbing them, getting to see things from a different view. Um, we're also fortunate to be able to see natural behaviors completely unscripted. You know, I had always known that albatrosses performed these elaborate ritual, ritual dances as part of courtship. But the first time I saw it live, I mean, I'll never forget that. But then I got to keep watching it every year that we've run this albatross camera. And I have never once gotten tired watching it. I'll, the neat thing is it's, it's, you know, six hours or five hours shifted from our time. We'll get the kids to bed. We'll be sitting, you know, sitting down after a long day of doing whatever in the middle of winter when it's been dark for hours and hours and sit down and I can flip this on and every once in a while like two birds come walking in, the grass is green, the sun is shining, you know, everything is beautiful and these birds are dancing for you and they don't even know we're watching. So I know they're not actually dancing for me, they're dancing for each other. And that's a really neat feeling. Um, especially when you think about how long lived these birds are, the longest lived species that we know that's still breeding in their 60s, um, they can get up to and uh, it takes them a long time to master that. So watching these birds practice endlessly or reinforce a bond almost endlessly on cameras is an amazing experience. We get to see touching scenes like this shot of Ezra um, presiding over the hatching of one of the eggs back in 2015. I think it was the only time when he was there when it was actually hatching. And unlike Big Red, who was a great mombrella of blocking the camera, this is the first time you really got to see this scene and Ezra's the one that let us see it by stepping to the side. Um, we had never seen it in such detail. We'd never looked at sort of this interaction between the adult bird and a young one hatching out. Um, and also that juxtaposition between this incredibly efficient predator um, that can tear a bird to shreds, how gentle it can be. And we'd see that time and time again as these birds fed their young, tearing off just the right size piece of meat, you know, to feed them. And even one of our you know, super common birds in North America, the American Robin was captivating when we just took the time to watch it. This was a, a camera we were able to uh, set up very quickly this spring, nesting on the, on the building. And everybody knows that they eat worms, but I don't think people knew much about something called fecal sacs. And it was a, it was a really fun, it was a really fun conversation to have with people. So we knew they ate worms, you know. Um, but this, this, this happens in lots of passerine birds. 
And it's a great opportunity to talk about why it happens, why they're eating them. What was that? We had someone ask if they were laying, why were the babies laying eggs? Why were the adults eating them? You know, and that's a perfectly reasonable way to look at what's happening, you know? Um, so this, this natural world that we're able to watch all together just winds up generating all of these shared observations and com conversation starting points. And away from the nests, we also got to watch a spectacular assemblage of birds at the variety of feeders that we have cameras on, as in this clip from the West Texas Hummingbird Cam. And this camera gave us all tons of identification challenges. You've got a dozen species, you've got different age birds, different sex birds. Some of them look very similar to each other. Um, and it was just a reminder to me of how much diversity there was in all corners of the world. Because when I landed in El Paso to install this camera, it's about three and a half hours away from El Paso, you would not expect there to be a bunch of life living around there. It's just, it just looks barren, it's desert. Um, but you get up a little bit into the mountains, a little bit of water, and it turns out there's hummingbirds streaming through there during migration. And um, to be able to sit there and watch, you know, right as a, a researcher is basically studying these birds, um, seeing the bands on their feet, it's really, neat. Um, and crazily, this camera last year had the very first record of an amethyst-throated hummingbird for the entire United States. Just happened to fly to our camera, our little camera down in West Texas. So you never know what's going to be around the corner. So it all comes back to this idea that anyone can make a new discovery any day, especially when it comes to watching species that haven't been well studied before. This was a green and white hummingbird nest um, in the hill, basically right below Machu Picchu. And um, it's actually a fairly common, oh, fairly common species in that part of Peru, but it's never actually been described. Uh, it's, it's breeding. And so in this, in this clip, you're gonna see the first time anyone's ever watched one of these guys fledge, you know, that moment of fledging. And, uh, and about an hour later, the other one fledged as well. But nobody knew how long they stood. They stayed in the nest even. You know, nobody knew how many feedings it took. And uh, between the recordings we made and the observations that were shared with us from viewers, we're able to describe this and hopefully we're gonna publish this at some point in the future. And even watching common species like the great blue heron yielded routine surprises. And these are events that field biologists would rarely see because they happen infrequently or, or they happen at night. So this is actually a scene at three in the morning we had this camera that was great. It could use starlight to give you a nice color image in the middle of the night. And uh, in the middle of the night, a great horned owl swooped in and attacked this incubating heron. So let me, let me play the clip here. Oh, it sounds awful. Right? Have anyone ever doubted that birds have evolved from dinosaurs, right? Um, to me, the, the juxtaposition of this bird that you think of as being stately and elegant and a master fisherman turning into this, you know, crazed defender of, of in this case, his, her nest, um, all puffed up. The, the rage almost that you can imagine being in that call. And that was a call that we, we don't even have a recording of in uh, the Macaulay Library of, of Sounds and Video. Um, and when I woke up at 5.30 in the morning, I had emails and phone calls waiting for me because someone had been watching, okay? And we might have missed this. You know, if, if we're scanning through footage very quickly, it's possible you could have missed this because it literally happened in 15 seconds, you know? Um, so between the people watching everywhere and the technology allowing us to watch everywhere, we capture these things often in the middle of the night that surprise us. Another surprise, this was playing in the reel at the start, was um, on our Texas barn owl cam, where one night, it's looking like there's kind of a lag in the playing of the clip. So you can see in the upper uh, left corner, there is an, a view of the outside of the box. And um, sorry, upper, upper right corner. And um, a snake, a rat snake, attempted to come in and predate the, the nestlings. And um, we can see this because of infrared lights, but those lights are invisible to the birds. Okay, so this is happening in essentially pitch black. There may have been a moon that night, so maybe there's a little bit of light that managed to find its way into 
this box, but she knows something's there. And you can see that snake now coming down towards the entrance. And in a flash, she is able to hone in on that snake and evict it from her nest, all in the dark. And no one can actually go along with a, with a barn owl as it hunts and, and sort of see the world through its eyes. But technology like this and the, and the opportunity to see it actually gives us a sense of, of at least what their ability is. You know, that this bird in, in, in near darkness can just pinpoint accuracy um, hit that snake. It was, it was just, to me, mind boggling. And last year, a viewer even um, spotted a flatworm descending into um, the burrow of the Bermuda petrel on the petrel cam, the cacao cam. And this happened again in the middle of the night. And um, you might not think much about a flatworm, but it turns out there are some flatworms that will eat flesh. And that this could have been for, you know, for a bird for which there are only a few hundred of in existence in the world. And every aspect of the management is revolves around making sure these birds that are in the burrows have the opportunity to fledge. We were allowed to, where we weren't allowed, we were able to the next morning, literally first thing, got our collaborators down in Bermuda on the phone, talked to them about the risk in this. They said, yeah, there could, this could be bad for the chick. We were able to go back and review the footage. And we were able to actually see that small little flatworm just land and then make its way out the, the burrow. It actually wasn't at least interested in the, in the, in the uh, nestling. It was the first time that's ever been seen in these burrows by biologists. So now they, they're aware of it. Um, and that's, that's another one of those kind of um, occurrences that would be very hard to see if we were just scanning the footage kind of quickly for major events that might be happening. Um, so human eyes, your eyes out there, amazing resource for people like us and you trying to understand what's happening. Sort of thinking a little bit more about this idea of being a field biologist in your own living room. Um, thousands of people spent untold hours living the life of a lance-tailed mannequin researcher. Patiently watching a branch most of the time until a male or female arrived and a flurry of activity followed. And people watched this enough that they got, to, they got the ability, you know, at some point to realize when things were different than what should be sort of quote unquote normally happening. Why are these two males spending so much time sort of aggressively jumping at each other, right? And they'd, they'd write out and ask, this isn't what normally happens when they're there. And, um, and it turns out on this display perch was this little bit of a power struggle unfolding across the whole year where there's a beta and an alpha individual there, but another presumably bird that thinks it's an alpha was trying to sort of edge in on this display territory and possibly take it over. So we don't know what's gonna happen next year. Um, these birds tend to live a long time, they don't migrate. So hopefully we'll get an opportunity to see these same birds next year and see what, see what they're doing. Um, and then, you know, in addition to sharing these really infrequent events, um, viewers also showed like you, that you could really comprehensively chronicle all the details needed to sort of draw a very detailed picture of what's happening. Um, and a prime example of this was prey deliveries on the Cornell Hawks cam. Um, you know, for those of you who don't, I mean, I think probably most people here know where, where the Cornell Hawks nest, but it's literally about 300 meters that way, 250 meters that way along one of the parking lots that we showed you on the map where you could park. Um, so we knew that you knew that they'd be bringing prey to the nest. We knew they're like chipmunks, but even when we know that sometimes something unexpected happens in those prey deliveries. So in this case, there was a, there was a live chipmunk brought back, you know, maybe he played dead. Um, I don't think he realized that he was 95 feet up in the air. Um, and if my memory serves me right, well, the clip was supposed to go about three seconds longer. Both adults dive off after the chipmunk and he's brought back up a few minutes later. Um, so even though we knew that they were bringing chipmunks, you know, it was, it was kind of a neat thing to see. And, and one of the ways we found out about that is on Twitter. So for the first couple of years, a lot of this information was being shared on Twitter. And you can see here on the, on the left side, you know, here's a, somebody tweeting about, um, that, that live chipmunk being brought to the nest, as well as some other chipmunk deliveries down there. So for the first two years, we had actually a very comprehensive timeline just in our Twitter timeline of what was being brought. And then that evolved in the uh, third year into like a cloud-hosted spreadsheet that had auto-completing totals, um, 
It's totally volunteer led. It's totally community like um, overseen. It wasn't us. We said simply, I remember saying it, it'd be great to get a little bit more information about, you know, what's coming to the nest, like in a little bit more easier because I'd have to go through the Twitter timeline and pull all that information out. And when there's like maybe 4,000 tweets, it just takes a long time. Um, and this was all done by the community. And, and just to point out too, if you look down there in the bottom right, one of those food deliveries was pizza for Carl and Bogat there. That's why I love this screenshot. So they were there doing some live streaming and even, even the prey deliveries to them got chronicled sometimes. Um, but what we were, we were able to do with that is actually then start to look at this information. It doesn't exist in this form in the literature. Nobody has a census from four years from the same two birds with the same number of young that all fledged successfully. And so just, you know, we were able to start looking at the data and saying, okay, well, what, what patterns are we seeing? So in this chart here that we have up, there's four different panels there, 2012, 13, 14, and 15 from top to bottom. On the y-axis on the left side here is the prey mass. So we used sort of standardized masses for each of the prey items that they would bring. Uh, and then along the x-axis is the season day. So starting from the first day of each year, going all the way until fledge, um, till the, I think till the first fledge. And um, the green bars are big red and the blue ones are Ezra. And so what you can see, number one, if you look at Ezra's contributions across the years, it's amazingly consistent. You see blue every day, pretty much at a, at a particular level, it's around 400, often uh, between 400 and 600 grams of, of food brought per day. And then you see sometimes these big peaks that often involve um, really good pigeon hunting or rabbit hunting. Um, but that changes each year. There's no like totally even way that it's described each year. Um, we can also look at, well, how much total did each of them contribute? So again, here, the green is big red and the blue is Ezra, but you can see that Ezra some years accounted for almost 81% of the prey mass brought to the nest, okay? And we can break that down a different way. We can look at what kinds of prey were being brought. And then these, these ones at the bottom, those big purple wedges, that's the only one I'm gonna talk about right now, but those are chipmunks, okay? And, and I thought this was a really interesting thing. Catch 100 chipmunks, how many are you gonna catch the next year? About half. Catch 120, what are you gonna catch the next year? About half. And, and I don't know if that's reflecting changes in the chipmunk populations, but you can definitely imagine that impacting them. And so even a, ch a chipmunk researcher might actually be interested in these kind of data because they show just one pair of hawks, what they're able to pull out of the environment. And so um, we're working on continuing to summarize these data. I actually um, gave a talk about this at the North American Ornithological Conference last year in Washington, DC. And we're hoping to prepare a manuscript for publication so that other scientists can, can learn from all of the effort that the community has, has undertaken over the years. In the same way that you've gotten the taste, gotten to have a taste of field biology from your own living room, um, you've also gotten the chance to converse and interact with people studying these birds. And so um, you've been able to ask questions, share observations through live question and answer sessions. So we talked to, at the top there, biologists working with California condors, um, uh, studying small birds and nests, as well as ospreys out in Montana. And each of these opportunities, those experts also really looked forward to because it was a great way to learn what people are questioning and need and wanting to know. Um, and so we hope to continue to do more of those in the future because uh, we get a lot of great feedback from people that they like them. And so thank you guys for just being such great participants in those question and answer sessions. I think I'm going to have Ben come up and take over from here. Thank you, Charles, and I uh, just wanted to take a moment to thank everybody else here for coming this evening and joining us online. Um, I've been with BirdCamps Project for just over a year now, and it's been the most overwhelmingly positive experience that I could ever imagine, um, being a part of viewing the lives of these birds as well as a part of the community as well. So I have to thank everyone for that. Um, well, we know that these birds show us so much through uh, their impacts on science and the discoveries uh, that we see through watching the cams. Um, but one of the most striking revelations that we have is being exposed to their intimate lives um, and just the determination that they have to survive and raise their young in the face of so many challenges. The reality is that birds face challenges all the time, um, whether it's through predation, through low food availability, 
harsh weather conditions and even uh, things that are like human caused threats. Um, and the risks are even greater during the breeding season when they're trying to raise their young. And there's really no better example of this than back in 2012 when we all watched a blizzard roll through Ithaca and roll through Sapsucker Woods on our um, heron cam. We can just see in this time lapse that the snow is building up and up and up and almost covering uh, the female heron as she's incubating her eggs. Uh, but what do we see? She just gets up, shakes it off, sits right back down, uh, doing what comes natural, uh, doing what she's determined to do, and that's um, you know keep her eggs warm for the next uh, to give them a chance at life. Um, so. We witness these type of things all the time on the cams and the bird's ability to persevere in the face of difficulty is really inspiring. And on, along that same vein, um, I'm sure many of you are familiar with this moment. Uh, it's often referred to as the dad brella moment on our Cornell Hawks cam. Uh, this is when during a uh, April rainstorm, Ezra actually zoomed up to the nest to shelter um, Big Red and their eggs um, and young hatchlings. Uh, the, all of the eggs hadn't hatched out yet. But you can see um, that this amazing moment brought us all a little shelter together. And uh, it's something that we can all really be inspired by. Not only the devotion between a mate and his partner, but also the devotion of the parents to their young in the nest. And this was no short rainstorm. This, they were hunkered down here for um, about 30 minutes, uh, keeping their eggs warm and sheltered from the, the cold weather. But we also know that uh, natural conditions can sometimes be too powerful to overcome. Um, there's no better uh, instance than back in 2015 on our uh, Hellgate Osprey cam in Missoula, Montana, uh, when a sudden and powerful hailstorm came raining through Hellgate Canyon. And you can see these devoted parents, um, Stanley and Iris, the Osprey pair, trying to shelter their eggs from this bulleting hailstorm. But ultimately, it was too much to overcome, and unfortunately, all of their eggs became damaged, and it ended their chances for the breeding season that year. But what it didn't stop was uh, didn't stop us from watching. We continued to uh, watch the ospreys. They rebuilt their nest from this hailstorm. Uh, they stayed together um, through the rest of the breeding season in Hellgate, um, and then. They eventually kept interacting, bringing fish to the nest. Uh, they kept reinforcing their pair bond despite this loss that they faced during the breeding season. And their resilience in this case is really something that resonated with all of us in the community. We also know that the challenges that these, bird fa these birds face aren't always from nature. Sometimes they come from the impacts that humans have on their environment. And while we're sticking in Hellgate Canyon, uh, we know that ospreys, when they're building their nest, they collect all sorts of things. Um, they bring sticks, moss, pine cones, greenery, but sometimes they also bring man-made materials like baling twine, uh, fishing wire, synthetic netting. And these are all things that can be uh, very dangerous to the ospreys themselves and their chicks, especially if they get uh, tangled up. So lo and behold, Louis, the male on the Osprey cam this year, did just that. He brought in some synthetic netting uh, to the Hellgate nest. But because our birds are so lucky to be on cam and have such a wonderful community, community surrounding them, uh, we were alerted within the minute that it happened by our, both our volunteers and our uh, community members that are watching. And here you can actually see uh, that we were allowed to, um, we were able to uh, contact our partners, the Montana Osprey Project, who uh, uh, worked with, Hel with, with the Hellgate cam, and they were able to get out a lift and up in the nest within hours to remove this obstruction and uh, help the ospreys continue to breed or continue to start building their nests that year. And through the community's growing support and awareness of these problems, uh, there's um, you know, a real inspiring message here that not only have you helped 
birds like these, but it also helps projects like the Montana Osprey Project uh, continuing to address issues like baling twine um, and uh, promoting awareness throughout Western Montana and the country. Many viewers were also a bit confused uh, during the first year of our Laysan albatross cam on Kauai when a young albatross named Kaloa Kalua um, actually regurgitated a bolus of indigestible material on camera and it contained over 30 pieces of plastic. Now you can see here is the bolus that um, the young bird uh, regurgitated and it contains some um, uh, squid beaks, which are sort of natural indigestible material that they regurgitate uh, naturally. But we also see up to 30 different shaped pieces of plastic um, and pollution that they pick, their parents picked up in the ocean. And the possibility of plastics and trash even being an issue for the species that spends nearly their entire lives over the Pacific Ocean foraging was a new concept to a lot of people. They didn't realize just how much plastic is in our oceans and that seabirds even uh, went to ingest it. And even though researchers are tr still trying to um, understand the impact that these plastics actually have on this species, we know that it's estimated that up to five tons um, of plastic are being accidentally fed to their nestlings on uh, Midway Atoll, where the majority of the breeding population of the Lays and Albatross uh, breed every year. And after learning about this hazard on cam, it really hit home for a lot of us in the community. Uh, some viewers wrote in about swearing off plastic. Uh, they wanted to know, how do we stop this problem or what can I personally do to help um, these albatross. And through everyone's observation, um, we started to ask questions. We started to get feedback from one another in the community and viewers across the world started becoming part of the solution just by watching these cams. One viewer even wrote in that it's literally changed their lives uh, learning about the plastic pollution problem in our oceans. And nowhere does this reality of the risk of, uh, man, of a man-made environment become clearer than with our own Cornell Hawks here on campus. Um, as I'm sure most of you are aware, in multiple years, um, as you can see, um, many juvenile hawks have been injured or killed due to uh, collisions or interactions with other um, man-made hazards on campus. And this all sadly eventually culminated uh, with Ezra's collision, collision injury and death um, earlier this year, um, right before the breeding season. And we've learned together and prepared for this reality that most juvenile hawks don't live past the first year. But understanding the causes of why it happens, under seeing it play out through the effort, efforts um, of the camera and of our community, our birders on the ground who have tracked and followed these birds on a daily basis, it really drove home this topic for all of us. And now what we're showing here is a bit of a haunting image. This is actually a collision um, from the juvenile G3 back in 2016 um, when it struck a window of the bus shelter on the right here. And you can actually see the imprint that, the, that it left on the shelter with its feathers and its bill down at the bottom. Window strikes are estimated to kill 599 million birds in the United States alone each year. And uh, however, the good news is that uh, making window safer is an easy thing to do. And it's something that any of us can do, anybody in the community, anybody around the world. And many people are now helping to raise awareness because of what they've seen um, watching the cam and learning about uh, this hazard in the community. One viewer wrote that with the death of G3, everyone started um, researching bird strikes and helping to learn options to prevent them. This particular event uh, led to an effort to research the best ways to mitigate the risk that these actual bus shelters had to our hawks on campus. And uh, thanks largely in part to the help of our birders on the ground, uh, Carl and Cindy, both shelters near the hawk nests were fitted with a rather stylish design of bird tape. Um, um, and it was applied according to the most recent research on how to reduce uh, collisions. And before this, this all happened uh, just weeks after the collision and before the next season was upon us, making sure that um, these shelters no longer pose a risk on campus. 
However, we know that there is still a lot of work to do. Um, since birds on campus and in these urban environments come in contact with these windows and hazards on a daily basis at every turn, uh, we know that from this event, the Hawks have become an ambassador for our education. They showed us um, why it's important to do more and what we can actually do to help. Also in some instances, um, we know that the birds on cam are actually a member of a species that's faced challenges for years, um, including even being uh, driven to the brink of extinction, like our California condor here on the California condor cam. Um, and it's really interesting because it's a species that continues to require ongoing management, um, even in order to main, maintain just a sustainable population in Southern California, Arizona, Utah, and Baja, Mexico. Um, in fact, the cameras that we use um, to show the condor cam are actually utilized by the U uh, US Fish and Wildlife Service and, our, and their partners at Santa Barbara Zoo and everybody at the condor recovery program to monitor these nestlings as part of a, a nest management strategy in order to increase condor nesting success in the Southern California population um, on the condor cam. And in 2016, last year on the cam, tens of thousands of viewers actually got to witness the nesting of one of these magnificent birds. And they saw firsthand the opportunity uh, to learn the backstory of how much effort it actually takes for these birds to succeed in the wild. Um, the Coford's Ridge pair, which, who was on our cam last year, um, had laid an egg and successfully incubated for about two months time. And it was about a week away from hatching. We were just about to launch the cam and the egg disappeared from the cavity overnight. It was likely taken by a predator, um, but because we were watching, luckily, um, biologists were able to rush into the nest site and insert a fake egg in order to keep the adults interested in incubating. And it actually worked. Um, then the biologists would return to replace the fake egg with a captive laid egg uh, from the captive breeding program at just the right stage um, before hatch. So, Let's take a ride with these condor biologists in this clip uh, from 2016. We watch them descend into the nest cavity. The adult flies out. They come in and uh, replace this dummy egg with one that's just about ready to hatch. And this is really amazing. The female enters right after the biologist leaves and it resulted in a net positive for both the adults and the possibility for the chick uh, within that egg to add to the wild population. In the same vein, uh, we all glimpsed into the otherworldly burrow nest of the Bermuda petrel on our uh, Bermuda petrel cam this year on Nunsuch Island, Bermuda. Um, this is one of the world's rarest seabirds. And in fact, it was even uh, thought to be extinct for over 300 years before nesting populations were discovered in 1951. Um, and now that they're clinging to survival, it's only thanks to the Bermuda um, government, the biologists working every day, um, tracking the nesting populations, uh, the nonprofit organizations and the people in the community, just like you who are bringing awareness to this bird um, and uh, learning about their struggle to survive. Um, we often watched as the nesting on cam was checked upon by Bermuda Department and Natural Resources uh, Terrestrial Conservation Officer, Jeremy Medeiros, who manages the entire breeding population of the species. And his work ensures that each chick has the best likelihood to survive and uh, have the opportunity to fledge and uh, become part of this breeding population. And we all eventually cheered uh, a little bit wistfully when it climbed out of the burrow for the last time and fledged over the Atlantic Ocean, where it spent the next three to four years of its life only to return back to Nunsuch to try breeding uh, for their first time. So here's just one of those clips where heavy enough so that even um, one of the many times Jeremy it. came in to check on the, on the petrol, chick, just a little fluff ball at this time. Obviously been he actually opens up the top of a man-made burrow, the which the petrols nest in, 
And these are really exciting times because we got to see the birds in natural light. And he would actually pick it up out of the burrow and explain as he took measurements um, and uh, told us about how the development of the chick was going. And uh, gave us sort of a time frame when we would expect it to fledge or when we would expect it to lose its natal down. And uh, so this is basically a, so it was a really six day old, cute little fluff uh, on this one. So um, as we mentioned earlier, uh, one of the most powerful aspects of the bird cams is that they allow people from around the world to share in very real experiences shown on these cams. These experiences not only, I'm gonna pop out here real quick. They uh, not only build connections between all types of people, but also all over the world. And I'm just gonna show you a quick photo um, or a quick video here. And many of these experiences are shared back with us as well, including this sixth grade class whose teacher featured the red-tailed hawk cams in class. And in this clip, they're watching the very same clip we showed you with Ezra and his new hatchling earlier in this talk. And I'll just let you watch. No, you sit down. Oh, he is so close. Blocking the way. So it's it's so amazing seeing all those young people excited about birds and science and their excitement is truly infectious when you, uh, you get to have those things uh, from the community shared back with us. The experiences with these birds also inspire people in many different ways. As Charles mentioned earlier, it, uh, makes people inspire by um, volunteering their time, uh, but also by expressing themselves through art, poetry, and literature. Um, and as you can see, we've received just an outpouring of art throughout the years um, across all of our cams from people of all ages expressing their love for birds and looking to give back uh, through their spirit of community. And over and over again, we've also been touched by the passion and generosity of viewers, uh, such as David Cohen, who's here tonight. You may have seen uh, this Ezra, for those of you who are here, you may have seen this Ezra sculpture out in the lobby earlier. Uh, it's absolutely amazing. And uh, um, also Karen Lobel Freed, who created this block print of uh, Lays and Albatross as part of her book um, that's inspired by the Lays and Albatross called, uh, titled A Perfect Day for an Albatross. Um, both artists have decided generously to sell these works and donate the proceeds to support the bird cams. And uh, we'll definitely share more information um, about these works on our bird cams website in the coming weeks for those of you who aren't here tonight. Um, for those of you who are here, you can also see um, the, the pieces themselves out there for more information. And of course, we're also very grateful for the gifts of our birders on the ground or our bogs. Uh, who have spent countless hours outside on campus with the Cornell Hawks, tracking them, updating the community about their adventures through photography, through live streaming, through different blog posts. Um, and we've asked them all to share one of their favorite captures or memories throughout the years uh, with everyone tonight. Uh, Carl and Cindy Sedlicek, who probably spent one of the most times uh, following Big Red and Ezra over the years on campus together, um, they are so dedicated uh, that they also blog about the birds and do a live stream uh, with the community about the hawks when they follow them around campus. Uh, they shared this striking image of Big Red and Ezra with their red tails fanned out uh, for everyone to see um, when Ezra greets Big Red atop a post as they uh, shared um, time hunting together in the Cornell plantations. Uh, Christine Bogdanowitz on the right, um, who's collected a jaw-dropping gallery of photos of the hawks over the years um, shared this moment of Ezra 
uh, when he seemed as if he was just posing for the camera for her in front of uh, um, an ivy covered wall on uh, Cornell campus. Uh, Ferris Akel, who also conducts a weekly live stream from our Sapsucker Woods um, and is also live streaming tonight. Thank you, Ferris. Um, shared, his, shared that his experiences with the Hawks have taught him that there's an entirely new and beautiful world right here on campus with the birds, if we only take the time uh, to sit and look. And Suzanne and Woods Horning, who are always counted on for an update with the Hawks on campus, uh, uh, they were called a family moment that they shared with Ezra and G2 during a squirrel hunt. And we often hear from community members not only about what they learn about the birds on cam, but how the birds teach them, the birds' experiences uh, teach them about their own lives. Here we see that one cam watcher's respect for all creatures on earth here is grown by watching the cams. One um, uh, faithful osprey watcher says the ospreys are so resilient. If they can get through what they do, then we can do the same. And uh, one viewer even found a little Zen moment from watching the Cornell feeders and learned how to be calm and quiet during a busy day. And one viewer even wrote in uh, saying, thank you for the wonderful view of these great birds. I'm 81 years old and you've given me a view I never dreamed I would see before. And the views from these cameras are views that none of us would, ever seen, uh, would have ever seen from this perspective before. And it is an experience that really binds us all together, sharing um, what happens with these birds. And we know that one thing is for sure, it's that the cams provide a keyhole into the most, most intimate times of these birds' lives. They show us a whole new perspective on nature. They teach us things about our own lives. Um, they also can be counted on for a surprising revelation or even a glimpse into the unknown at times. Um, <clears throat> it's an idea that's been captured in a simple refrain from our Hawk Camp community, and that's look up. As a tribute to Ezra's legacy, uh, many of you and uh, many people in the community have donated funds to create an educational panel for a new sustainability trail on campus um, that's uh, um, scheduled to go up later this year. Our design director is currently working on, uh, on the panel to share the inspiration about bird life, sustainability on campus, and the message uh, from our hot, com hot cam community, uh, look up. So we hope uh, someday soon we'll all have a chance to, uh, to witness that in person. Witness that in person. Um, and speaking of looking up, let's start uh, looking ahead. I'm gonna pass it off to Miyoko and she's gonna tell us a little bit about the future of the cams. All right, well, thanks, Ben and Charles. It was all beautifully said and presented. Um, and I really hope that all of you who've joined us tonight feel as inspired as I do about the, the power that these CAMs have with discovery, conservation, and community. Um, it actually inspired our team to work during the last two years to really envision how we could build on this incredible momentum by connecting viewers and scientists to work even more closely together on unraveling new discoveries. And so I'm thrilled to let you know that just last month, we received a major grant from the National Science Foundation uh, to do just that. <laughs> And uh, it was a collaborative effort from the start because thousands of you actually responded to a survey that we put out asking you questions about your interest in participating in science through the CAMS. And so we used that information in our proposal. The three-year grant will help us build tools and support for what we call co-created research, which really means investigations that the community and the scientists conduct together, all the way from asking questions to figuring out what's needed to answer those questions, to pursuing the answers. So this differs from traditional citizen science projects in which participants typically would collect data for the scientists to use. And instead, we'll be asking you, the community, to pose the questions and the scientists will collaborate with you to bring your investigations from start to finish. 
So the lab's web team is going to need to build some new tools so that in addition to not only viewing the cams and being able to chat about them as you can now, uh, that we'll be able to actually let you comment on footage, uh, tagging the footage uh, in a way that they, they become data for us to be able to um, bring those data out in ways that we can analyze them and tools for you to be able to visualize the data online as well. So that will all be layered on top of the wonderful CAM experience that we already have, um, but that will enable those who want to, to go uh, deeper with the science. There will be a new kind of opportunity for public participation in science, and it'll generate discoveries not only about birds, but also about ways of supporting questions and investigations that are driven by communities. So in the coming months, um, we'll share more information about this project with you. Um, we invite you to work with us as we develop it, hatch it, and grow it. Um, by working with you, we hope to chart an even richer way to collaborate across living rooms around the world. And so in closing, Charles, Ben, and I want to express our heartfelt thanks to you, our community, for being co-creators in our CAM experience, past, present, and future. And we really look forward to continuing the adventure with you. Thank you. So with that, we are happy to open up for questions and or comments, if you, if, even if you just want to share something. We'll alternate between uh, in-person and live stream audience. Are there any questions here? No? Okay. Does <laughs> anybody have any, any uh, questions or reactions uh, for tonight? Burning, burning questions. Yeah? Go ahead. I, I will that I, I haven't watched the webcam, so I'm curious what happened with the condor. Uh, with, oh, with last year with the replacement? Yes. Yeah, it's a great, uh, great question because. Um, yeah, so the question was, what happened with last year's condor? We showed the footage of the egg being replaced and just all the effort that goes into it. And that bird did make it to successfully fledge, but unfortunately um, died soon after. Uh, and that, that sort of underscores the, the, the challenge of being a wild animal. Um, these birds are, they take a long time to become adept at what they do. Uh, it takes them a long time just to grow. Um, we're talking you know, months and months of growing time. When they do start taking those first flights, um, they can find themselves in a position that's not great to be in, um, or just not necessarily recognizing that there's a threat. And in this case, it looked like it may have been predated by something. Um, but, because uh, the crazy thing is, you know, biologists have transmitters on these birds and they can track them. And um, the way that works is if a bird doesn't move for like eight hours or 12 hours, you can, you can it'll send off a different kind of signal to alert you that this bird might not be well. And so it was a very quick turnaround, but even by the time they got there, the bird was um, scavenged to the point where it was hard to necessarily know exactly what happened. But on the plus side, um, you can call it the plus side, I guess, the bird died, but as compared to what happened the year before, which, which actually the bird died on that one as well, um, lead was the primary reason two years ago, the condor flipped, didn't make it. Um, lead's a continuing issue for condors because condors only eat dead things. Dead things sometimes are riddled with lead bullets. And uh, lead bullets for hunting aren't outlawed in all of California and Arizona, just within very small ranges that the condors actually can travel widely outside of. And so at some point between when it was checked on at four months and when it fledged at around six months, it was delivered a, a near, not essentially a lethal dose of, of lead that really made it unable to, to survive uh, that fledging process. But the, this year's bird is looking great, Devil's Gate. Um, so I encourage everyone to tune in. It's been spending a lot of time in front of the camera, stretching its 10 foot long wings. So um, really excited to hopefully, because all it's going to take is one to make it. We'll actually have an individual that we'll be able to follow for potentially, you know, maybe not the rest of our lives, but you know, for quite a long time, 20, 30 years. We'll Call is there one from the audience, Miyoko? Just want to make sure. Come up and share your comment. Okay. 
and then we'll go to you next. So online audience, if you have any questions, please feel free to put them into the chat. Uh, we didn't have any questions that I saw yet, but we had a really nice comment. And it's one that I wanted to share with all of you and to preface it by saying that educators around the world um, have done so much to bring these CAMs into their classrooms and to engage their students with it. We hear a lot of feedback from students about how much their students love it. And so this comment, I think, echoes a little bit of what goes on in the classroom. And I want to thank Mohawk for posting this in the chat. My seventh graders have watched the CAM since 2014. They often mention the hot can in their graduate presentations. I just put the can up on the active board when they arrive in, in homeroom each morning. It served as a backdrop throughout the day. We did math and science lessons via a hatch chart for the 2016 G group. So thanks to all the educators out there who are doing things like this on a daily basis. That's great. Um, do you have a question? Two parts. Actually, I don't know if you said already, but where, how do you decide where our camp is going to be? And I'm sure you asked all the time, because you can just another bar in the Okay. Yeah, so the two questions are how do we decide on where, uh, what cam do we stream, and also whether or not there's going to be another barn owl cam. And um, I can certainly take the first one first. Um, we are, we're a really small team here. There's actually two people that work full time. It's Ben and I. We work with a team of great people that do a lot of other things uh, along with helping us with this project. And so a lot of our um, camera opportunities have really come through collaborations with people who have figured out uh, they either have a camera already on a species. For example, the Hellgate Osprey cam um, initially had a camera on that osprey nest. They reached out to us to help with the live streaming, the messaging, and working together to, to build a greater impact for that camera. Um, Sometimes it's purely a stroke of luck that Robin nested right outside a window where there was an active internet port, right? Right, um, that guy in an eBird shirt in the middle of the room there it was his office that I put the wire in through the window. Um, thank you very much. And, um, and we were able to very rapidly do that because I had an extra camera sitting around and the, and the, you know, the Robin's a really um, you know, uh, resilient bird that lives near people. We didn't have a lot of things to worry about. But in some things like the, the condor cam, you know, it took four years of working with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to finally get that online. Um, same thing with the albatross scan. That was like three years of working with the Kauai Albatross Network to find the right spot that had broadband internet. Um, so a lot of it just comes down to logistics. We need internet and we need power. And we don't have the time or funding to really do a whole lot of research and development on how to like think way outside the end world. Um, you want to talk about or you want me to talk? Yeah, before you. So um, I have definitely communicated with a lot of folks about the Barnell Cam that was retired last year after a hard um, 2016 season, um, and we are currently searching for new opportunities for the Cam. Um, definitely, some of the things we want to make sure we have with a species like the Barnell, who is so high risk and prone to you know starvation. And, um, you know, problems with uh, low food availability on CAM. Um, we want to have a researcher or some sort of RNL expert to actually uh, be a partner with on a CAM, uh, on our next CAM that we're planning. So we've been researching it and uh, we certainly want um, to do that for the community um, because we know the RNL CAM has inspired so many people, so many great questions and has such a high following. Um, that we definitely want to do that for the community. Um, it's just finding that perfect spot to, to have a good um, good relationship with someone who um, can really provide sort of a scientific background to what's going on at the CAM while it's happening. Yeah, you can almost think of it as a broader context too for understanding what barn owls do. So we can be more responsive to the community when those questions and those, in, those inevitable hard times come up. They're a boom and bust kind of species and that can be a very difficult thing to experience online, as everybody learned, including us. One second. One second. We're Charles, one. are you coordinating at all with Steve Kress and Project Puffin, which has a, at least one and so, or several bird camps? Uh, yeah, so I wouldn't say we coordinate with him. We, we talk with him in the hall all the time. Um, he streams, all the cameras from Hog Island are streaming through explore.org. 
and that's through a grant with them. And so all, his whole streaming relationship is through, uh, through explore.org. But he's a great resource at work. We, we trade um, CAM management stories when we run into each other in the hall all the time. So um, yeah, so we don't do more than that, I guess, at this point. Okay, so we have another question from the online audience, and my apologies, my chat had actually frozen and I had to refresh. So of course there are questions there, and we'll catch up on those. Uh, one of the questions is, are we going to be able to have a live chat? And um, you know, we've had that on some of our cams, not all of them, and we know that people really learn a lot from those chats. They can be very rich. Um, they also are challenging to manage, as our moderators know. We couldn't do it without them. They put an incredible amount of effort into it. And it can be, you know, um, exhausting at the level that we used to do with that number of hours in a day. I think it will be manageable to try to have live chat hours for restricted times, especially as we move forward with this NSF-funded project, which will, uh, we want to find out what are the methods that do enrich learning the most, and that's definitely one we want to take a look at. But as far as rolling them out across all our CAMs, we find that with our current capacity, that's going to be a bit difficult to manage. So learning more about it, and if it does prove to be incredibly richer with learning, that's going to tell us it's worth the capacity to try to do as much of that as we can. So thank you for that question. Was the, were you and others at the lab surprised at just the level of enthusiasm that you received for all the various CAMs? Yeah, that's a great question. So. Uh, when I was, uh, oh, sorry, so the question was, were, were we surprised, thank you, uh, were we surprised at sort of the, the level of, um, what was the word you used? Enthusiasm. Enthusiasm, yes, yeah, so the level of enthusiasm that we experienced after rolling out these camps. And, you know, honestly, I can remember interviewing for the position back in uh, 2011 uh, and being asked, like, you know, what, what do you think, what would be a good response? And you were, you know, during an interview question, you know, were a successful project, you know, what, how many viewers would make it successful? And you know, I'm sitting there going, um, thousands, tens of thousands. So, so in the one sense, I think that um, we had been shown what was possible by really the Decora Eagle Cam, which had just skyrocketed as a platform for people learning about bald eagles, um, really the year before we started our program. And it really opened our eyes in some ways to the value of trying to engage people remotely in an experience that wasn't just about the science, or wasn't just about, um, that. I guess the way to put it is, that also really thought about the viewer's experience watching it, and put that kind of at the forefront. So, you know, covering the technology side where it's actually fun to watch it, it competes with almost anything else that you could want to watch because it's beautiful and it's got nice sound. Um, but then using that as a platform to talk about birds, to bring people in, um, so were we were we surprised by the enthusiasm? I don't think we were surprised by like the fact that people were enthusiastic because I mean even us watching those first all around the lab the cameras were on from the moment you know, on people's computers you know from the moment that we flipped the switch and went public we knew just from in the building and knowing that there's 47 people that self-identify as bird watchers basically in the United States that there was a lot of potential there. But I think the level of not just watching but also communicating. Like I, I said in like that second or third slide, the amount of interaction that happened. You know, if you think about something like TV being super passive, right? People sit and watch. Maybe there are, you know, there's, there's other things to watch that maybe make you think more, but the fact so much energy was being spent on trying to understand and share what was happening. I think that was maybe what um, surprised us in a really good way. It, it made us think this is definitely something we need to keep working on figuring out the way to increase its impact within our, our capacity. Thanks, Paris. Thank you. So it sounds like some people in the chat may be having trouble with sound. Okay. So maybe we can just pause for a minute while we see if we can look into that. Can you hear me now? <laughs> mm. We're still, we're not muted. I don't, I'm not, I'm, I'm, Unfortunately, a little bit of a loss as to why you might not be hearing us because we haven't changed anything um, when we got to this part. Hmm. So nobody, so people can hear me on Ferris's chat, but not on our 
live stream. This is our way of uh, letting everybody know that Ferris has a live stream. <laughs> 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 Yeah, so I don't know if somebody could, could put the link in, um, in the uh, chat for people to see it. I apologize. So hold on, let's get the link going. Ferris, what's the easiest? Uh, go to Ustream, I think it's, hold on one second. <laughs> I believe it's Ustream slash Ferris Akel, but I'll, I'll try to find out. I found it successfully just by Googling Ferris Akel. <laughs> okay, that's, that's the way to go. So it's definitely on our radar screen as a possibility. Um, the, it's very complicated because all the internet infrastructure that's there is related to um, basically Cornell's secure internet for monitoring things out there. So um, there's some open questions with that and the fact that it have to be installed on city property. So I've had, I've had preliminary discussions with the city that have been seen very um, open to the idea, but um, at this point, there's nothing firm in place. Any more questions from folks here? I have a question. I think that one back there came up first. Um, we've seen human interference with the Condor cam. Yep. Uh, is that allowable to any extent? Yeah, so Condors are really interesting things. You think about Condors? Okay, so the question was, um, we've seen human interference on the condor cam, is that even permissible? Um, and in the case of the condors, um, the Bermuda petrels, most endangered species have um, management plans that outline exactly what and why biologists do what they do at those nests. So in the case of the condors, for example, um, there's a whole protocol outlining when they would try and do what they did um, for that nest. It had nothing to do with it being live streamed for us, it had everything to do with trying to have as many wild condors in the environment as possible, because that's what they're charged with. Um, same thing with the, with the Bermuda petrel, that those nest checks that are being done are to make sure that the nestlings are growing at, the, at the, you know, an ideal rate, that they're not um, basically fallen, uh, you know, gotten sick with something that could be fixed, basically to, to increase the likelihood that these very few birds that are being produced each year in the wild population have the greatest chance of going on and becoming productive adults in that population. So that's all the people interacting with those birds are working with the correct permits and, and, and the protocols and that kind of thing. Does that answer your question? Yes. Great. Thank you. 
So follow-up question from the live stream audience. Will you be able to film the Devil's Gate Condor fledging? So the question, yes, yeah, so the question was, maybe that's all for it. <laughs> um, will we be able to film the Devil's Gate fledging? So we had a plan in place to film the Coford's Ridge, the one we did last year. It was in that little cavity that you saw them go into. Um, the configuration of the canyon is such that um, we could have that camera inside the cavity, and the next hillside is close enough that we could have put another camera over there and gotten a shot of the outside of the cavity. And potentially, you know, both see the adults going in and out and the birds fledging. In the case of Devil Gate, Devil's Gate, um, that's not possible. Um, but it's something that the Fish and Wildlife are really interested in wherever it's, it is possible. Um, with the caveat that all of these cameras, are not just plugging them in somewhere, they're all running on solar, and they're all connected to each other on a point-to-point -point wireless network. So for example, to get that signal from Devil's Gate requires you know, a solar panel big enough to power that camera, as well as an antenna that's, that then talks to another antenna, a repeater, which then sends it up to the top of Hopper Mountain, um, to another repeater, which then sends it all the way to Ventura, 35 miles, in a point-to-point -point wireless connection. And so each of those points for every camera have to be established except for that main one on Hopper. And that's why sometimes we have problems with the can because uh, one of those can go down, and, uh, and then obviously somebody has to go out and fix it. I would, that actually sounds like fun, but um, <laughs> they do not call me to go fix those things. <laughs> So a few hands go up before. Hey, Carl. Can you tell us, uh, is there more that you can share about the grant and how, how people can engage in this sort of mutual science? Yeah. Uh, do, you want, do you want to take that answer, or do you want to? Great. So the question was uh, if we could uh, share a little bit more about the grant and how we're, what we're thinking when we say uh, we can have research conducted by scientists and the viewers together. So I think this talk showed really well what, what planted the seed in our minds, right? Because you can already see discoveries being made on the cans that weren't in the scientific literature. You can already see every day people asking questions about uh, what they're seeing on the cans and sometimes um, contributing observations that alert us to something that we weren't aware of and can sometimes bring attention to it either to other scientists or even we'd like to be able to publish more in scientific literature. So we know it's incipient, but what we don't have is an actual system or way to engage people uh, to do that at a deeper level. It's kind of anecdotal and organic right now. And what we'd like to do is corral that potential in a way that we can get the whole community, for example, working on a question together. So just as an example, the first thing that we want to try um, is a, on a feeder can, because we think that might be simpler to implement. So imagine that you're watching the feeder can, and we put out a call and we say, um, anybody with uh, questions you're curious about investigating now that you're watching these cans? And we imagine we're going to get so many questions, um, and I don't want to you know, save them all because you guys are going to come up with them. Uh, but then we would engage um, our team as well as a graduate student that we're going to bring on board to engage in dialogue. Okay, so we've got all these questions. What would it take to start to try to answer some of them? So then we start getting into the phase of uh, protocols and study design. And people can think together, okay, what do you, would we actually need to collect to get that? And could we do it on these cans? Once we have a protocol or a, um, a method we can share with everyone and invite everyone to participate, what we would really love to have is live data annotation. Right now, there are quite a few projects that enable the public to annotate still images. Um, there's a project called Zooniverse that's been fantastic for that, and they get you know, just thousands, probably millions of annotations. You may have heard about this for astronomy, where people are looking at astronomy images and helping to recognize stars and other phenomena in the universe. Um, so, but what is less common is live annotation. And we know from you that live annotation is going to be probably more engaging than looking at snapshots that are archived or even footage that's archived. 
So um, we want to do both. We want to try to offer that you can go back in the archive and help us look for certain kinds of data and tag, depending on the question. But we also would love to find a way for you to do that right when you're watching. Let's say we've collected all the data, kind of similar to what we saw with the Hawk uh, community putting that all on the spreadsheet, it just happens to be in our database this time. We'd love to find a way for you as viewers to explore those data to query. And also, maybe you want to plot two things on a simple graph, like um, the, the season and the number of each kind of prey, or something like that. Finally, and this is kind of where we go back to that question about live chats, um, we'd love to have live Q&As with our scientists the way we do now, except those conversations might be focused, in this case, around the investigation. Okay, now that we have some data, now that we have some graphs to look at, what do we, how do we interpret this? What are some ways we could suggest that uh, the meaning behind the data? And finally, it's going to be the graduate students charged to formally analyze those data statistically and then also to write them up for publication. It will definitely be publication on our website. We hope it will lead to publication in scientific journals. So you can imagine that sounds pretty ambitious. As I mentioned, this is a three-year grant. And the grant is really to create prototypes to see if we can be successful with this kind of model, which is new. You don't see this happening anywhere else. Uh, and so it's going to be a learning process for all of us. And um, we hope to, by trial and error and evaluation, uh, come up with something that, that we hope really works well. Does that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. Yeah. All right. Give me a second to uh, look at my spreadsheet from the live chat here. So we have questions about um, whether any of the natural um, disaster events like hurricanes or wildfires have been affecting any of our plants. Okay, yeah, so basically the quick answer is no. Um, so, oh, did, did it come from there? Oh, you want to read that? Oh, okay, right. So the question was whether or not the hurricanes or any other natural disasters like the fires out west have affected any of our cams. And um, outside of taking the Savannah Osprey cams offline for a couple of days when power went out on Skidway Island, um, all of the cameras have been up and running and there aren't birds in them for the most part at this point in time. So um, even in Montana, uh, the ospreys were there basically through a summer filled with smoke um, and then left only recently. Uh, so they don't appear, the, the smoke didn't appear to have a, a negative effect at least on, on their behavior um, around the can. What about in the Caribbean with the, uh, the small nesting, burrow nesting? Yeah, the petrels? Yeah. Yeah, so they're, the nice thing about them, I mean, well, it's nice in a sense. They're far enough away from the Caribbean that they have yet to be impacted. So they're more almost on, on you can think of them as being more an Atlantic island. Um, so as Jose, if it ever comes closer to the US, if it does go towards the East Coast, Jose would be passing kind of between the US and Bermuda there. Um, hurricanes are a huge threat to petrels. Okay, so the whole reason why they've done uh, one of the main reasons why they've done these translocations, so that all these man-made burrows in part were there to translocate young from other nests on smaller little islets to this larger, higher island to reduce the likelihood of hurricanes destroying the nests or killing adults or, or chicks. So um, hurricanes and, and just global sea level rise are two very big factors, both for petrels and for the albatrosses, actually. So not on Hawaii, necessarily, but you know, 98% of the world's population of laser and albatrosses are on two atolls in the middle of the Pacific that are only a few feet above the current level of the um, ocean. And it's predicted over the next you know, 50 to 100 years that the intensity of storm events and the, just the sea level rise may make those islands uh, much less productive than they are now. Um, and possibly remove them from you know, uh, being you know, great places for albatrosses to breed. So on Hawaii, you know, in some ways, people think about Hawaii as this um, interesting, like almost Noah's Ark in a way, of the future because the islands are so much taller. But the challenge there is they're also 
filled with people and private property. So that, that sort of is a shout out to the work that the Kauai Health Trust Network has been doing to interact with private landowners and increase awareness of the um, of what albatrosses need on Kauai. Great question. Anyone else in the room? Yeah, back there. Um, I just wonder what you, how you handle a, a catastrophic loss of a can. For example, this heron picture that I'm looking at right here. Um, a few years ago, when this heron hatched out five babies and they went to the medical thing, that was just amazing. And then to learn that the, uh, that the nest was lost was just tragic. So I wonder, you know, what's next? How do you handle that? Right, so the question um, for folks online is how, how do we handle sort of the, the catastrophic loss of nests like what happened with um, the heron cam? Uh, catastrophic in the sense that uh, you know, the nest basically fell out of the tree, and, and in that case, they weren't really showing a lot of interest in breeding that year either. So, um, you know, the, the challenge, the, I guess, I don't know if it's a challenge exactly, or, or it's a mindset or a perspective, there's just very little we can control. And, and I come into this job, that's what I say to myself every day when I walk into work, because every day something I can't control, like glitches and presentations, is going to crop up, because things are just A, too complex. So we can't control the natural world, we can't control most of the technology between me and this camera. I can, I can control like how it's installed, but I can't control what happens to it after I install it a lot of the time. So part of it's just the mindset where you know, even at cameras that are super important to us as a program because of just their following, and we know that that following can have a big impact, you know, there's, there's still a limited ability of us to safeguard really anything about those cameras at the end of the day. But what we try to do is have different opportunities to engage audiences, always kind of like if you have a portfolio or a quiver full of, um, you know, different um, opportunities for people to interact with birds online. Um, and then different individuals, hopefully, to, to rapidly be able to turn to and say, hey, can we make this happen? So um, that's really the only way we can deal with it. And, and I think by providing forums for people to talk about it so that everybody can commiserate but understand what we've learned from it, be thankful for it. You know, those, those herons are a great story because Setsucker Woods has been there for a long time. That pond was dug back in the 50s, okay? And yet, despite Seth Rucker Woods being named 100 and roughly 10 years ago, as far as anybody knows, those five years that there were herons there were the only time during that 100 years that people have been watching where herons have nested in Seth Rucker Woods. How lucky were we to be alive? And alive in a time where we could throw a camera up there and share it with the world. I mean, like, so, so a lot of it comes down to perspective, too. We can be strategic making partnerships with people so we can pivot very quickly if something does go down so that people still have this ability to connect and learn and share. But at the end of the day, we also have to you know, acknowledge what we can't control and not let it get us down. Wow. That, that, those were amazing years, I must say. They were. Here, here. They were amazing years. Alright, we have two questions from the online audience that relate to Ezra. One of them has to do with the art, uh, the carving that David has done, and the other has to do with the um, planned educational panel. So first, since we have David in the audience, um, I'm going to give him the option of whether he wants to be put on the spot and come uh, give the answer to this question himself, or whether he'd rather be summarized. But the answer is that they read in his bio that he's working on a full-size Big Red and Ezra at the Nest piece. And they wonder if that's going to have a problem at Cornell. Uh, so David, would you like me to just do that? Or you want to come up and share a little more about that work? Great, he's coming up. So online audience, uh, give us a minute while David comes up. And we would just love to hear a little more about your plans for that carving, anything you want to share about Ezra and the carving that you displayed here tonight. And again, I'll repeat for the online audience that David has generously offered to donate his carving of Ezra um, and the proceeds will go to the lab of oncology. We put a link in the chat if you're interested uh, in more on that, and we'll also be sharing it on our website. Thank you. Um, so the full-size nest scene is something that I've been dreaming about since I first encountered uh, Big Red and Ezra 
uh, back in the early days of the campsite. And I wondered how to best put that together, and I've had a lot of opportunities to design it. And when this last season um, really hit us hard with Ezra's passing, uh, I was more and more dedicated to completing the project. But the next scene uh, will be full size. The sculpture that's available now is a half size study, which was basically done so I could convince myself that I could do in wood a portrait of Ezra, um, as opposed to, say, a painting or a drawing, which is a little bit easier to work with. So the study was to convince myself that I could use wood and actually do a portrait. Uh, and I think I've proven that, that that is the case, or at least I've proven it to myself. It's up to you to decide. Thank you. So right now I'm working on Big Red in full size, and she started out as um, about a 15 pound block of wood, uh, which is slowly being shaped uh, into the pose that I envisioned for this nesting. That will be a semi-mantle uh, big red hovering over some prey that she'll be feeding to some chicks. It has been my dream, as I expressed to Miyoko and the others here, that it has been my dream that when that work is complete, that I would like very much to donate it to Cornell for permanent display so that the community can share and share it. I don't envision it as a work that will go up for sale. Uh, I can make other uh, works, but this one will be for expressly for the purpose of permanent display here at Lab for Ornithology, uh, because I know that it means so much to the people that have um, been part of the Hawk, Hawk Hand community. And you know, I saw a lot of that today, where people feeling so much when when they saw the carving of Ezra and how much it meant, uh, how many people already miss him uh, and, and continue to mourn for his loss, but this is just a little step to try to bring some of that back. So the answer is yes, it will be something that I will certainly make available to Cornell for permanent display. Uh, and I hope that's the case. It will be at least a two-year project. Uh, I am working on it now. and. Uh, I anticipate at least a two-year project because the, the, the half-size study took about eight months to complete that one piece. Uh, so I'm being very optimistic and thinking that I can complete the whole nest scene in two years. Um, but you never know, with all this energy behind it, maybe it will go a little bit faster. Not much faster, because it is incredibly detailed work. Uh, so thank you. Um, so the question is, can you tell a little bit more about the plans for the educational panel that's a tribute to Ezra? So um, there were lots of ideas that we received about how can we best pay tribute to Ezra, who's really touched us all so much. And after a lot of thought and discussion, one really thing that we thought would be very meaningful is to think about what legacy Ezra gave us. And it is that legacy about look up because what can you experience and learn by doing that? We wanted to share that with the Cornell community because um, as some of you may have seen when you parked near Tower Road and those nests are right above you, it's really easy to walk by and not even know that they're there. I walked by for years and didn't know that hotels were on campus and nesting. Um, and so we just feel if only more students and more faculty and people on campus knew to look up that they would be able to experience some of the things that we have as a campus. Uh, a wonderful coincidence happened, which is that Cornell is working on a sustainability trail right off of Tower Road. Some of you might be familiar with the Dairy Bar, and across the street there are facing plantations. 
They're going to put in a green parking lot and then the little walkway that goes from there over to Mann Library and to where we are tonight will be a sustainability trail. And they'd like to put in more education about sustainability on campus. Another coincidence is that Carl and Cindy brought to our attention a spot where Ezra used to love to perch above the botanic gardens there, as well as where the hawks would hunt on a, on a grassy hillside. And they recounted this anecdote of seeing one of the botanic garden uh, landscapers really actually taking care of that hillside for hawks. He was trying to maintain the grasses so that it would attract the hawks in because by attracting the hawks, he could get natural rodent control instead of using pesticides. And we know that pesticides can be, or rodenticides can be really harmful for hawks because if they nab a rodent that has that in their system, those can be an anticoagulant in their own system, which can hurt the hawks. So how beautiful that here at Cornell, the landscapers were creating habitat for the hawks and for other wildlife. And it happened to be a spot right along the sustainability trail. So we're collaborating with botanic gardens and facilities here to install that in the next year. We've drafted the text, which has three parts. The first part is, um, well, it's called Look Up. And it encourages people to think about the habitat that they're seeing and list 10 birds that they can see, including red tails, of course. And then the next section tells a little bit about sustainability. And then there's a little blurb about that sentiment from the Hot Camp community about what you can experience by taking that time. So I want to thank everybody who um, not only contributed donations for that, but who also contributed ideas. It's, it was a collaborative project, as is everything that we do. So one last question for the night. I appreciate what you said about um, savoring the moment or the experience because we're not entitled to them. They're just given to us. And as one of those people who really struggled today to come and see the places where Ezra had been and all the places I heard um, Bogette and Carl taking us all over campus following them, um, I understand that there's work still being done on the hawk cam. Yes. And the other part of the question is, since I've kind of moved away, in fact, I've focused on this one cardinal in my neighborhood who seems to like my corner of the neighborhood, and he sings almost all the time. And he's a daddy, and I think he must be a wonderful daddy, although I didn't see any babies. Um, what is going on that we know of about Big Red and her friend? Great, so the question is uh, two parts. Um, one of them I might have to ask for some help as I'm answering, but uh, the questions involved is, it sounds like there's some work going on the Hawk Camps when we talk about that, and what do we know about what's going on with Big Red and um, the other Hawks we've been hanging out with this summer. So I'll take the first part for sure. Um, so uh, as, as you all probably know, the Hawk Camps have been offline for several months, and that all stems from um, essentially a failure in the cabling that connects our network that's up on those poles to the infrastructure in Wild Hall. So when it went offline, I worked for about, about six weeks with CIT to try and salvage that connection. Um, and at the end of it, they just said, look, it's just not going to work. You need to go to this. You basically need to, to, to upgrade it all to fiber, um, which is great. I mean, it just costs a pretty penny to upgrade to, to fiber. But the biggest issue with that is we then had to get into a queue, basically, for CIT to do that work. And that queue was about two months long. Um, anybody who's been at Cornell in the summer knows that there's a lot of construction that happens here in the summer. And there's a number of buildings that are going up all around campus and even off campus that their small team of, um, basically, that their cabling experts were responsible for. So just last week, we finished upgrading the connection from Wild to that first pole with fiber. So we're connected now with basically more bandwidth than we've ever had before. And I've been running a test event, uh, basically a test uh, live stream for the last couple days to see how stable the cameras are and to uh, make sure that everything's working. And probably early next week, I'll flip the switch to make that public. And not that we expect anything to be flying in, um, on camera anytime soon, but you never know. In past years, 
Big Red and Ezra had visited off and on through the winter um, each of those nests. So we'll probably have one camera on at each nest so that viewers can view um, and toggle between the two of them. Um, so I'm really excited about that. We have, uh, you know, we may have the ability if they do stick together through uh, and decide to breed, if Big Red does decide to breed on one of those towers, uh, we'll be ready to go. If she, if she picks a different tower, um, it's, it's a hard question because the one thing I'll say is with, with Ezra, we knew they had a long history together breeding on those towers already. So my ability to um, be conservative about the impact that we would have rapidly deploying a cam over the course of a couple days on a site they were actively building on, as we did with the wild hall nest, um, I felt fairly comfortable with that because I had watched and been around those birds and seen them react to us, seeing their ease and basically nonchalance. Sometimes when we'd be 20 feet below them on the pole, they'd be mating up on the platform, you know? And, and so the, we don't want to ruin anything that could happen. And we don't know as much about um, the new guy, if it turns out to be the new guy, um, and his, his uh, reaction to us being up and around. So we'll just have to take it as it comes, but we do have sort of the, we've got it figured out how to make it happen fairly quickly on those posts. We just don't want to also ruin anything by getting up there and potentially disturbing them. So we have a couple of contingency plans as well. Um, I wonder if I could turn that second question around to the birders on the ground that are in the room. I know Carl and Cindy have been telling me the last couple days that you have seen dog, Big Red, and I don't know if Ferris or anybody else here has as well, but would, it, would you guys like to share any observations from the last couple days on, on the two of them? Yeah, so um, we can... So the one thing that, a couple of things that we've noticed about um, Big Red and, and Winkin's behavior is that, um, first of all, there seems to be quite a bit of commitment between the two of them. Um, the, we've seen uh, Winkin guarding Big Red when she takes baths in the gorge. Um, he has uh, de demonstrated his ability to defend the territory. I mean, there was concern among all of us when, after Ezra died, and uh, Big Red was so distraught and traveling the, the territory. She covered ter eight territories one day looking for Ezra. And uh, she flew all the way out to, uh, to Varna and Snyder Hill and then over uh, the Horsey Hill area. And then she flew diagonally across into Cuba Heights. And then she flew across North Campus. And so she basically touched eight hawk territories and flew right through them and was challenged in some of them and basically held her own, but she was look, looking for Ezra. Um, but uh, Winkin has, uh, among the ones, the, the males that have visited, she uh, one day went off to the northeast and we thought in fact that she might be uh, leaving the territory uh, because it had been a difficult time and um, she, and remember this was Ezra's territory, this was in Big Red's territory. So she came and joined him here. She was in from Brookendale. She's a country girl, mm -hmm. off to the east. <laughs> and uh, but this was his. He was a city guy. This was his territory, and so he brought her here. So she could have easily decided that she could not manage this territory and had gone off with somebody else. Uh, the good news is that everybody else was busy, um, you know, with their own territories that they were having to deal with and their own nests and so forth. So uh, she had a couple of suitors, and, uh, and Winkin seemed to be the guy who was most adamant about his interest. And um, he, you know, an example of his defense was uh, uh, defending the Southeast uh, Territory against the uh, Horsey Hull Hawks, which are pretty aggressive, actually. Um, Big Red and Ezra had to do that together. They couldn't uh, do that separately. Um, they were a very aggressive pair in that area. Uh, but one day, um, um, Winkin, uh, chased off three vultures to the east. It was kind of like um, um, Harold of England, if you know the story. Uh, they were all related back then, right? And so you had the Vikings, and you had the Normans, and they were all kind of uh, clans, and they were all struggling to take over England at the time, or Britain. 
and Harold uh, of England had to march to the north to defeat the Vikings, which he did, but he left his archers behind, and he had to then come down to the south uh, because William of Normandy had come to land across the British Channel. And so he had no archers, and so he had to go ahead and, uh, and uh, challenge the Normans, and he defeated, they were defeated because of the fact that they uh, couldn't defend themselves against the archers uh, at long distance. So Wynken went and chased off three vultures off to the east, uh, way out uh, over the plantations, and then he came back immediately, and Dick Gray was up on the Bradfield, and he, uh, he challenged uh, two retail hawks that had come in from the north and chased them off. And then he finally came back and sat on the tower. So they tried to uh, mate, and we've seen them uh, do that. And, um, and they have done the, the separate thing. You know, I mean, he is, uh, he's a data mind of his own, you know what I mean? So he, he has his uh, times when he goes separately. And uh, they, have, they have spent time on Riley Rob together in the sunshine. Um, and they have you know, done some preening uh, and some kisses a little bit. Um, and so uh, they did start uh, talking about the nests uh, that Charles was talking about. They did, um, I don't know if you're familiar, but you have the wild nest, right? And then you have the fernal nest, and then there's the, what we call the third base tower. And they had done some work on that nest, and you can go out there and you can see that it's sort of uh, partially built. But in the end, what they decided to do uh, was to actually take the fernal nest. Remember, all the nests are on the west end of the platforms. And so they decided to take the Ferno nest and move it stick by stick all the way to the east end of the platform. So they rebuilt the nest on the east side of that platform. So there's some interesting indications, you know what I mean, that they are uh, hanging together. We'll see what happens uh, during the winter time and then in the spring when they challenge each other to see whether or not they're capable of defending and fighting and, and, and getting prey and so forth. So uh, it's an interesting time. He's a young guy. And, uh, and she's not so young, but it doesn't seem to matter. They're, they're doing, they're doing pretty well. He's, uh, he's gotten, uh, he was very champagne colored, very light colored uh, naturally, but his, uh, his molting, he's darkened up quite a bit. He's got some of the nice red on his shoulders and stuff like that. So they're like an old married couple. They can start to look like each other. <laughs> so anyway, we'll see what happens, whether or not they, uh, they stick, stick together, and we'll see what happens in the spring. Well, with that, um, I think that's going to bring tonight's um, event here to a close. I want to thank everybody for showing up online and in person. Um, we're going to um, feel free to grab a bite on your way out, and we're going to do our best to archive the talk out to see how the audio comes out. So I apologize for the issues. Um, I hope it's not indicative of our efforts moving forward with uh, any of our other technological projects that we might be planning. Um, thank you all for coming, and uh, can't wait to keep conversing with you online or in person when we get the chance. So thank you. <laughs>